of the of the graphene week, uh, and particularly uh, we start this session with one of the persons who is leading uh, uh, the research in photonics and, and photovoltaics and uh, energy conversion using graphene and 2D materials. Uh, he is uh, Harriet Water, uh, Howard Hughes Professor at the California Institute of Technology. He is currently also the Editor-in-Chief of the journal ACS Photonics of the American Chemical Society. Uh, Harriet Water has been leading, as I say, research on photonics, plasmonics, metamaterials, energy conversion, solar, uh, solar energy research, and, uh, and uh, many of us have been following uh, his work, right? Um, on top of uh, being a, a professor at the Caltech, he's also currently the director of the DOE Center for the Energy Frontiers Research, particularly in solar energy conversion and, and photovoltaics. So, uh, as I say, uh, it's a pleasure that today's plenary talk is started by, by Professor Water. Hurry, please. That's applause. Okay, yeah, it's my pleasure to be here today to tell you about uh, work gone, uh, which has occurred in uh, my research group at uh, Caltech on tunable light matter interactions, which I'll frame as a grand challenge for photonics. And if we think about the opportunities that are presented by nanophotonics, this really gives us an unprecedented opportunity to tailor light at the nanoscale where we're structuring matter at and below the scale of the optical wavelength itself. And uh, in particular, this gives us an opportunity with uh, two-dimensional arrays of structures, as I'll describe today, to do spatial manipulation using uh, arrays of materials on surfaces to control the scattered and reflected light from surfaces, to control spectrally, as indicated by this uh, beautiful uh, watermark, uh, structural color, very much like the um, uh, stained glass windows from, uh, uh, from and, and uh, stained glass artifacts from uh, the Middle Ages. This is structural color with, uh, created by resonant absorption from, by geometrically tuned absorbers. And in nanophotonics, we can also generate uh, structures for strong light confinement using surface plasmons and uh, sub-wavelength scale, nanoscale antennas, which is very important in applications related to optical sensing. So even if we think about the uh, structures of two-dimensional arrays of uh, scatterers on surfaces, this is a problem that was uh, understood even uh, in the 17th century by Huygens, who uh, gave us insights about the sculpting of light uh, by reflection and refraction from 2D objects on a surface, such that the scattered phase formed the outgoing wave front for light emanating into the far field. And this principle has been embraced more recently in the last five years or so by a burgeoning research field uh, focused on 2D metasurfaces, structures that are less than a wavelength thick that enable phase uh, and uh, amplitude and polarization engineering in 2D arrays of antennas to control the properties of light in the far field. And this is a summary of some examples in which the uh, geometrical properties of optical antennas allow one to control the phase uh, and the amplitude and polarization of, of light uh, to create very powerful optical elements. So one aspect about all of these structures that are depicted here is that all of them are encoded by the geometrical structure of the nanophotonic uh, 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 structures on the printed on the surface, but these are static, and so therefore they're uh, fixed at the point of fabrication. So what would uh, really be uh, uh, an exciting opportunity 
would be to structure antennas capable of controlling essentially all of the constitutive properties of light, the wave vector, the wavelength, the amplitude, the phase, polarization, all as functions of time for interactions including scattering, absorption, luminescence, and thermal emission. Uh, and the, in, in essence, uh, if we can develop uh, tunable antennas and structure these in arrays, then that would give us an opportunity to achieve this comprehensive control of light. And that has some very interesting potential uh, uh, applications and manifestations, including at optical and infrared frequencies, the ability to use uh, light in phased arrays to steer beams for light uh, analogs to radar, to produce uh, optical holograms for information display, to control directivity in light emission for communications, and to control actively the radiation management of uh, uh, large objects. In nanophotonics, uh, since the uh, beginning of work in this field, uh, work has concentrated initially in the use of 3D materials, uh, noble metals and uh, dielectric materials, semiconductors like silicon, in which we sculpt plasmonic and dielectric resonances to tune the properties of uh, nanostructures. 2D materials, uh, such as graphene and other 2D uh, uh, materials, uh, which are inspired by uh, the original example of graphene, give us a unique opportunity by virtue of their thin structure to tune the electronic and optical properties using electrostatic gating or optical interactions, which add a component of active tunability. And so what we can uh, see it through a series of examples that I'll share with you today is that by combining the materials resonance of the geometrical structures of antennas and nanostructures, together with the materials resonances, uh, the tunable properties of materials that where we are able to control dynamically the permittivity of materials, we can combine these to achieve uh, unprecedented tunability. So I'll first start by telling you something that you already know, which is that graphene has a spectacular set of physical properties and in photonics, the Dirac-like band structure manifests itself in a dispersion relation, linear dispersion relation, and <clears throat> the ability to form a, a sheet uh, in a layered header structure form allows us to tune the electronic carrier density and importantly also therefore the optical permittivity of graphene. And in particular, uh, in achieving strong light coupling to graphene, uh, plasmons play a particular role. So plasmons are collective oscillations of the electron gas in a material and propagating plasmons uh, run like uh, way, ripples of uh, similar to water waves running on the surface of a pond are uh, uh, waves that propagate on the surface uh, of a material, in the case of graphene, the uh, graphene sheet itself. And the spectacular aspect about graphene is that the wavelength is extremely confined and the optical modes are extremely confined relative to conventional three-dimensional materials. Another spectacular feature here is that the resonant frequency and dispersion properties are proportional to the carrier density, which as I mentioned, we can change electrostatically or by optical uh, pumping, giving us a contro dynamic control of the properties. So I've shown here a uh, depiction of a traveling or propagating wave on graphene. We can also pattern graphene into nanostructures like the ribbons depicted here. And these exhibit standing wave-like resonances. And as we change either the geometrical dimensions of the ribbons or change the carrier density, we can tune the properties of these ribbons. So the resonances will span across uh, a, a range in the infrared. Here, as we change the graphene Fermi level and carrier density, we can achieve resonances that are tunable. We also see that these resonances give rise to modes that are extremely confined within a few tens of nanometers of the graphene sheet itself. So seeing is believing, and indeed, uh, some spectacular evidence for the surface resonances and extreme confinement were first seen by the group of Frank Coppens and Dmitry Bazov, who you'll hear from uh, shortly, uh, showing in near-field microscopy uh, experiments 
that uh, vivid evidence of the presence of uh, standing waves in, in thin tapered ribbons, uh, which uh, revealed the high confinement factor uh, and the tunability of the uh, graphene ribbon uh, sheet. So this really uh, illustrates uh, the uh, features that uh, graphene uh, uh, plasmons uh, are coherent uh, and they can exhibit strong resonances. So we can also look uh, using uh, nanoscopy, using a scanning electron microscopy, electronic force microscopy, and scanning tunneling microscopy. In this case, uh, at an array of graphene ribbons that have been uh, fabricated on a, uh, a planarized uh, uh, one -on one sheet of gold on mica to facilitate the STM imaging, we can see evidence here of ribbon, the physical structure of the ribbons. You can see here uh, the ribbons are uh, shown as fabricated by electron beam lithography, uh, and we are able to achieve relatively uniform ribbons. Of course, uh, in CVD-grown graphene uh, sheets like this, we, they are not completely single domain, and so therefore we have structure at the edges, and if we zoom in to the edge, we can actually see that the edges are manifest as a uh, the, the edges uh, construct into armchair and zigzag edges that uh, ultimately form the macroscopic edge defined by the lith lithographic pattern. And we can also achieve sharp uh, ribbon features, uh, although less commonly, by helium-focused uh, ion beam lithography, which is a versatile tool for patterning graphene. When we make ribbons uh, and put them into a structure that allows the t ribbon uh, carrier density be to be tuned, we can achieve uh, resonances here where we can see a, a sh systematic shift in the graphene plasmon resonance energy. So these are dipole plasmon resonances of ribbons which are proportional to the ribbon width, very much like the tone of an organ pipe being uh, proportional to the uh, the, the pitch of an organ pipe being proportional to the length of the pipe. Uh, and we can see features here due to the graphene plasmon resonance, uh, dipole plasmon resonance, and we can also see another sharp feature here which is related to the uh, underlying phonon polariton resonances in the substrate. If we now at a fixed graphene ribbon width change the Fermi energy, we can also see the polarizability and the resonant frequency shift uh, in accord uh, with our expectation, uh, indicating the uh, tunability of graphene re plasmon resonances with carrier density. And a vivid illustration of the extreme confinement of plasmon resonances can be seen if we couple a, a graphene sheet uh, to a monolayer boron nitrite film. And in this case, the ribbons in graphene, which exhibit dipole plasmon resonances, couple to the phonon polaritons in the uh, single layer boron nitride substrate and give rise to a splitting here, an anti-crossing of the degenerate uh, crossing of the graphene plasmon with the boron nitride phonon polaritons. And this splitting, this hybridization of the optical modes is indication of optical strong coupling, which is borne out in the spectra. Uh, and is an indication of the extreme confinement of the plasmons and graphene within a few nanometers of the ribbon that strongly overlap even a single layer of uh, uh, a, an underlying material such as boron nitride. And this uh, was a strong indication of the strong coupling and also the example of a very high uh, quality factor over mode volume achieved not because of high quality factor but because of extremely small mode volume. So graphene ribbons pattern into a, an array of structures with a tunable back gate to control the carrier density can be resonantly enhanced in their absorption properties by now creating what's called a Salisbury screen, a resonant interaction here where we couple the dipole resonance of the graphene plasmon ribbons to a resonant cavity here formed between the graphene plasmon and a back mirror. Uh, and that allows us to increase the absorption from a few percent, uh, the, uh, which is a characteristic of the uh, absorption of graphene in its non-resonant form, up to about 25% or so. And that's uh, due to the uh, resonant interference here of light uh, in the uh, graphene plasmon modes uh, and the cavity mode formed between the graphene ribbon array and the substrate. 
But the question is, would it be possible to achieve 100% absorption in, an, in a sheet of graphene? We know, of course, graphene is a strong absorber per unit layer, uh, absorbing 2% of the light in the monolayer, but that's relatively weak, and we'd like to achieve very strong coupling and strong uh, light matter interactions. So to do that, uh, it's important to be able to understand the conditions that would lead to uh, resonant light matter interactions. Uh, and these were first uh, outlined in a, a paper, a theoretical paper by the group of uh, Javier Garcia de Bajo, which framed the per possibility of perfect absorption in graphene by resonant interaction of a graphene ribbon with the substrate. And as I showed you on, the early, on, on this earlier work, we were able to achieve, and uh, other groups were reported similar results, about 25% uh, absorption in a, in a sheet, but not 100% as predicted by this uh, uh, paper by de Bajo and co-workers. And the challenge to achieve 100% absorption consists essentially in a very simple form in index or impedance matching of the graphene ribbon header structure to free space. In fact, if we optimally match uh, the impedance of this entire structure, uh, to free space, then we can approach to 100% absorption. And this simple structure, consisting of ribbons and a, a resonant reflector, has an impedance which is mismatched to the impedance of free space. We can come uh, and, and match the impedance by now combining plasmons in a metallic uh, uh, periodic structure with ribbons that are interspaced within the gaps in the metallic or slits of the metallic structure that exhibit resonant absorption of the surface plasma modes that are supported on the surface of the metal. And you can see uh, th by a simple uh, pr procedure where we first consider the uh, resonant susceptibility of the graphene sheets uh, and the coupling to the substrate, we can develop a, a model that allows us to understand the impedance matching. And uh, we can actually understand this in terms of the complex frequency analysis of the real and the imaginary part of the admittance. And for all of the electrical engineers in the audience, you'll note that we can plot this on a polar plot of real versus uh, imaginary part of the impedance, very much like a Smith chart for uh, uh, matching of uh, impedances in microwave uh, physics. And the reflectivity tends to zero, and therefore the absorption to unity when the uh, substrate coupling and the impedance of the graphene surface sheet itself are matched. And we can, this is a condition for any given uh, mobility of graphene that can be achieved at a certain carrier density uh, and dielectric spacing between the ribbon width and the back reflector. So by carefully adjusting the impedance, uh, we can achieve conditions that give rise to perfect absorption. And this was realized uh, in a series of experiments where uh, metallic uh, sh sheets uh, with slits that exhibit extraordinary optical transmission they couple surface plasmons onto the metallic sheet and funnel the light through the graphene ribbons. And you can see resonant absorption occurring. This is the total field and the X component of the field uh, for the conditions for the ribbons I showed you on the earlier slide. And in this case, we're able to achieve uh, a, uh, a condition where uh, for example, for uh, the structures uh, depicted here, the uh, absorption tends uh, as a function, which is tunable as a function of the Fermi level, therefore the voltage on the gate, uh, from uh, a value of less than 10% to a value of about 97%, essentially 100% within uh, the experimental control. Uh, and the modulation efficiency achieved uh, is very high in this resonant reflection. So this is an example showing the ability to control the graphene resonant properties uh, by careful uh, analysis of the impedance matching. And indeed what we can see is that the, uh, the graphene, although it constitutes about 10% of a monolayer coverage on the surface, is exhibiting 97% absorption and all of the other parts of the structure, the silicon nitride and the gold and so forth, are contributing less than uh, 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 three or four percent of the uh, total absorption of this structure. So we can also understand uh, if we can generate tunable absorption by reciprocity that's inherent in the Planck radiation law, that this would imply the possibility for tuning the properties of emission. So let's consider, first of all, that 
conventionally, we think of black body radiation coming from material with a bulk emissivity as being something which is modulated by uh, varying the temperature of that black body. So if the emissivity is constant, the emitted power can be controlled just by uh, controlling the temperature through the Planck radiation law. However, if we have a tunable absorber and therefore tunable emitter on the surface of a hot body, the electronic permittivity of this tunable absorbing layer can modulate the radiated power at constant temperature and therefore much faster than we could achieve, for example, by varying the temperature itself. Uh, so if we now heat uh, an, a, a structure very similar to the one that I showed you before for the resonant absorption and monitor the thermal emission, what we can see here is that the thermal emission is in fact uh, tunably controlled at constant temperature here of 250 degrees C by controlling the carrier density. And in fact, uh, the clear evidence that this is uh, coming and mediated by coupling through graphene plasmons comes from the fact that the ribbons have a characteristic polarization dependence to their emission. And so if we cross-polarize the emission, we extinguish the emission, uh, the, the tunable emission. And so this is an evidence of the electronic control of the thermal emission of a body at constant temperature. So if we design ribbons uh, that character are characterized by uh, resonances that occur as a function of frequency and uh, geometrical parameters here, for example, for 40 and uh, 60 nanometer ribbons, we can achieve, in fact, resonances that uh, and couple uh, to the ribbons uh, characteristically as we vary the carrier density, first to the 40 nanometer and then to the 60 nanometer ribbon. Uh, and by then orienting these ribbons in a, uh, an array where the uh, thick ribbons are oriented in one uh, of two orthogonal directions on the substrate and the thin ribbons in the other direction, we can now generate a structure that allows for tunable polarization conversion. So this is an uh, important property of light that we want to be able to control to be able to tune the reflected polarization uh, to be either copolarized with the incident wave or cross-polarized relative to the incident wave. Uh, and we can do this by making ribbons where the variation of carrier density allows us to selectively excite ribbons in either the X or Y orientation relative to the uh, surface of, of, of a substrate. Tunable arrays of uh, resonators and graphene uh, can be coupled to an array of antennas that, uh, for example, uh, gold antennas, which have st uh, overall stronger scattering. And graphene, used as a tunable dielectric material, allows us to control the absorption and the phase. And if we are able, in fact, to control the phase, uh, we can, in principle, generate a phased array, a phased array very similar to a phased array radar, but here at infrared frequencies, which allows us to control electronically uh, the uh, beam profile of the wave emanating from this array of resonators. So in the spirit of Huygens, each of these resonators has a distinct scattering phase, similar amplitude, but scattering phase, each control, each, the phase of each resonator controlled electronically. So using a Michelson interferometry uh, 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 configuration for measurement, we're able to show that graphene, re resonate, graphene uh, tunable elements coupled to gold resonator arrays uh, in the mid-infrared can achieve phase modulation of, uh, as we change the Fermi level on the graphene by uh, greater than 230 degrees. Uh, and at different wavelengths, we can see characteristically underdamped and overdamped response. And the overdamped response gives us a nice tunable variation in phase with graphene Fermi level. And this principle allows us then to control, therefore, the phase of the uh, emitted and scattered radiation from arrays of antennas individually by controlling the electronic properties, uh, uh, the, the carrier density, and the phase of individual uh, uh, antenna elements. So this depicts an array of 28 uh, elements uh, that are uh, where we're able to systematically vary the uh, graphene Fermi level and therefore the phase. And we can see here in a scheme for a three level or a four level phase modulation in a periodic array, we can produce electronically uh, at infra infrared frequencies 
a sort of blazed grating, which will then give rise to a characteristically steered beam at an angle of about 25 degrees here. Uh, and by varying the number of elements in the array, we can uh, vary the steering angle of the uh, light. And so this allows us to achieve uh, radar-like uh, uh, steering of beams at, at infrared frequencies. So particularly interesting are the carrier dynamics in graphene. Uh, and this has been uh, studied by a number of people. Um, and, uh, and if we look at gra the uh, characteristics of graphene, uh, under optical excitation, we can find that under ultrafast optical pumping that uh, we, we generate a, under prompt excitation uh, holes and electrons uh, far away from the Dirac point. Uh, and then on a short time scale, less than 100 femtoseconds, these uh, hole and electron populations, which are initially sharply non-equilibrium, begin to uh, um, relax and locally equilibrate among the electron population and the whole population. Uh, and then on a, sh on a somewhat longer time scale, we develop a, uh, a common temperature, but a different Fermi level for the electrons and the holes. And gradually these relax uh, here to the point where the electrons equilibrate by electron phonon coupling uh, with the lattice and finally then return back to the ambient temperature. So this entire sequence of uh, phenomena from optical excitation to carrier carrier scattering, uh, and then can proceed then through several different uh, relaxation processes, including Auger recombination, phonon emission, optical phonon emission, acoustic phonon emission. Um, but another process that uh, uh, can compete with these uh, processes related to phonon emission is the emission of plasmons. And indeed, uh, in this theoretical work from the group of uh, Ortwin Hess, uh, it was shown that it's possible to achieve, if we look at the dielectric function of graphene, the imaginary part of the dielectric function at short times during optical pumping is negative. That corresponds to conditions for gain, whereupon we should see uh, a combination of stimulated and spontaneous emission of plasmons. So this theoretical work, uh, uh, was something that we wanted to follow up on. And so in an experiment, but we uh, looked at the uh, uh, far field radiation emanating from an, a graphene sheet. Uh, in this case, it's a continuous sheet of graphene uh, where the Fermi level position in the graphene is uh, controlled by a counter gate that's optically transparent here of indium tin oxide and light is out coupled through scattering antennas which are sparsely distributed on the surface. So we're optically pumping here with uh, ultrafast excitation from a tie sapphire source uh, with uh, approximately 100 femtosecond laser pulses. And what we can see is that if we look at the, uh, at the laser fluences uh, applied here, that uh, we expect uh, during the electron-electron uh, relaxation to see uh, an equilibration of the electron gas out of equilibrium with the lattice. Uh, and then during a short period uh, on the sub-picosecond timescale, from a few hundred femtoseconds out to about a picosecond, there's a, a region where we can see uh, uh, ultra-fast emission. And indeed, uh, the group of Tony Hines was able to see uh, about 10 years ago uh, optical emission, ultra-fast optical emission, which they interpreted as being a photoluminescence uh, and related that to optical phonon coupling. Uh, so if we look at the uh, characteristic uh, 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 plasmon emission, so in this case, uh, at this very high temperature, this corresponds to a condition for uh, inversion of the uh, 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 electron population and therefore conditions uh, that are uh, uh, conducive to plasmon generation. And indeed what we see in optical spectra under ultrafast pumping is uh, an additional component, so this shows the thermal radiation without any laser radiation under gated uh, conditions. You can see a very weak gating dependence uh, to the uh, emission. Uh, but under optical excitation, you can see a, a, an additional component between five and seven microns that's of comparable strength to the thermal emission that's coming from ultrafast optical excitation in the infrared. And you can see that there's a strong gate dependence to this. And if we look at uh, now uh, taking that prompt excitation coming from the inversion region and we time integrate the emission 
uh, at various graphene Fermi levels, we can see that the uh, conditions here for uh, where, where gamma, a positive value gamma corresponds to gain and a negative value corresponds to absorption, we can see that by varying the graphene Fermi level, we can vary essentially the gain in the structure. Uh, and if we look on this time scale, if we resolve on the time scale, we can see that during this uh, cooling and uh, uh, th that plasmon emission corresponds to a, a condition of cooling uh, and th that the gain falls during this time period on the sub picosecond level. But if we integrate uh, over this uh, 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 plasmon gain in the sub picosecond level, we can actually develop a, a theoretical picture that accords uh, reasonably closely with the observed additional component of infrared emission in addition to the thermal emission, which is dominated by thermal radiation equilibrium or steady state thermal radiation emission from the silicon nitride uh, due to the emission of plasmon. So this is a, a far field uh, emission coming from the spontaneous emission of plasmons. And we can see here also a nice correlation from this plasmon emission model uh, from uh, uh, spontaneous emission with laser fluence as well. And similar observations were made by uh, Dmitry Basov's group uh, in the near field where they saw hot plasmons in the 10, uh, 10 to 12 micron regime and were able by uh, fitting carefully the a characteristic dispersion relation for these hot plasmons uh, to determine uh, an effective temperature of the hot plasmons in the several thousand Kelvin regime. So these were experiments that were performed uh, using uh, observations from near field microscopy. And uh, this far field emission that I've just told you about here uh, indicates that uh, plasmons constitute a source of ultra bright and ultra fast mid infrared spontaneous emission. In fact, the fact that the uh, uh, radiation is of comparable intensity to the thermal radiation, whereas the duty cycle of the optical excitation uh, is more than uh, three orders, orders of magnitude smaller uh, than the uh, characteristic duty cycle of the steady state thermal emission, uh, then allows us to uh, understand that the uh, spectral flux, the number of plasmons or photons, if we could compare thermal emission with the spontaneously emitted plasmons, uh, can be several orders of magnitude higher than that coming from a black body, even at several thousand Kelvin. So we think this is quite interesting uh, as an opportunity to use far field light emission uh, to uh, make a potential candidate ultra fast and ultra bright light source in the infrared. So, uh, of course, graphene is a material that inspires exploration of other materials. Uh, and I want to share with you some uh, findings about the, some of the interesting optical properties of black phosphorus. Black phosphorus, of course, is the, one of the allotropes of phosphorus in a crumpled uh, uh, la uh, layered structure, a layered allotrope, which has uh, a uh, uh, ver very interesting uh, optical properties, which has a tunable band gap, uh, direct band gap, uh, depending on the thickness, ranging from the uh, mid-infrared uh, into the visible frequency range. It also has a large in-plane anisotropy in its optical properties uh, and uh, has the opportunity, therefore, to be a very interesting near to mid-infrared optical material. In essence, black phosphorus is a naturally occurring quantum well. So as we make thin layers of black phosphorus that are arranged from monolayer to multilayer, the vertical confinement of optical modes in these flakes leads to quantum well-like states. And we can therefore use the same gating approaches that we used for graphene to control electrostatically the electronic properties of black phosphorus. Indeed, with a single gate, we can see, uh, we can move the Fermi level in black phosphorus and produce uh, changes in the optical properties, which are interpreted as a band filling or Burstein moss like shift. Uh, and by uh, using uh, a, uh, a floating configuration for the black phosphorus in which we apply a field across the black phosphorus, we can see evidence for a quantum confined stark transition. And therefore we can also see physics like the uh, transition from uh, states which are forbidden uh, in a symmetrically excited quantum well structure to allowed states uh, by uh, breaking of the forbidden transitions. So black phosphorus is, uh, in this case, in, gated in a similar sort of structure. In this case, we're now applying a, 
uh, a, a bias between the black phosphorus and an underlying back gate. Uh, and we're using a light source, unlike an infrared uh, spectrometer, which is a little bit brighter, which is the tail of the uh, synchrotron radiation from the advanced light source in Berkeley. And what we see in the black phosphorus transmission spectra are characteristic wiggles that are, are, are characteristic in, uh, in, uh, as we gate black phosphorus from uh, a negative to positive gate bias of a transition of the doping from N-type to P-type and characteristic of motion of the Fermi level that corresponds to band filling and emptying of the bands uh, and these uh, characteristic modulation of the transmission are indicative of uh, an ambipolar Burstein Moss effect, uh, where we're moving the Fermi level uh, from the middle of the gap to filling up the, the lowest lying uh, subbands for electrons. In a slightly thicker flake, for here 14 nanometers, the thicker flake now creates a wider quantum well, effectively, and therefore we have uh, a greater number of 2D subbands, more wiggles in the spectrum, and therefore you can see these sharp wiggles here in the uh, density of states which are indicative of the onset of additional two-dimensional subbands, uh, which we can see emptying and filling of in, as, as a function of gating. In order to uh, achieve uh, a, a band bending uh, or, or an electric field in the absence of band bending, we can apply a structure where we now leave the black phosphorus floating, but apply a field from a top gate of palladium to a bottom gate uh, of silicon in a symmetric gating configuration. Uh, and in this case, what we see is uh, a, a band bending that uh, gives rise to a stark shift of the uh, transitions. And we also see that the uh, uh, initially orthogonal subband states begin to hybridize. And we see the onset here of states that are uh, 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 forbidden uh, in the uh, uh, in, in the zero field unperturbed state, which are now become allowed uh, because of the hybridization of these uh, subband states. Moreover, the features here indicate an in plane dichroism. This tunability exists along the armchair direction, but we see no change in the permittivity or polarizability along the zigzag direction. We can also see, uh, and, and so that's indicative here of uh, changes in the uh, carrier modulation and a gate tunable dichroism. So we can tune the in-plane properties under gate control. If we now move with this different header structure, but the same kind of physics, uh, symmetrically gated header structure with a floating layer of black phosphorus, we can also see in thin layers, similar in-plane tunable dichroism at optical frequencies, ranging here at optical uh, energies here in the range, uh, in the mid-infrared to visible range. And so this is an indication that we can see an anisotropic ele electro-optic effect manifest from the uh, nanoscopic and atomic scale properties of black phosphorus along the zigzag and uh, armchair directions. So I want to say, uh, just in conclusion, uh, that the work itself I've reported on here today was carried out by a very talented group of students and postdocs, uh, Victor Brar, Seyun Kim, Laura Kim, Michelle Sherrod, and Will Whitney at Caltech. And I'll just leave you with these conclusions, that tunable light matter interactions uh, in graphene allow strong coupling to the near field environment, tunable perfect absorption, control of the scattered polarization, control of phase and beam steering, tunable thermal emission and insights about ultra-fast and ultra-bright emission. So uh, it gives us an opportunity to meet this grand challenge of controlling comprehensively the optical properties of light in a dynamically tunable fashion. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Harry. So usually in plenary talks, sometimes there are no questions, but uh, we are happy to have like a session of a few minutes for, for some questions. Harry has illuminated us literally with the uh, use of graphene for photonics, but uh, he's also director of a DOE um, uh, center of research, Frontiers in Energy in the US, and you might want to ask him also about his views on
uh, on European, American, uh, Asia kind of uh, uh, counterfeit in, in, in or, or fighting or, or competition in English. So please, uh, let's ask uh, a few questions to Hari in, in six, seven minutes. Any questions? Uh, my name is uh, Sharali Malik from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. Um, I was very interested in your uh, um, work on black phosphorus. I was wondering how stable is your encapsulation material? It's great material, but uh, of course it's not air stable. Yes, okay, so black phosphorus, uh, you, you highlighted one of the challenges of working with black phosphorus. Uh, and indeed, uh, so of course uh, all of the synthesis is done in a glove box environment. Uh, and uh, we monitor carefully uh, with studying the composition and looking at the uh, properties of the material with uh, Raman spectroscopy, uh, what happens over time. And we, do, we can see, of course, examples of oxidation. And in fact, wherever there is oxidation, of course, the uh, quantum wall properties change. Effectively, they get thinner. Uh, so we can see uh, it actually acts as a, the, the uh, optical inner subband absorption acts as a very sensitive indicator of the effective remaining black phosphorus thickness. But encapsulation is certainly an important uh, issue for black phosphorus, yeah. Alexey Kuzmenko from the University of Geneva. Uh, you showed this wonderful uh, measurements of uh, optical absorption, which can be 100% in some uh, graphene devices. Um, can you, uh, so is it possible to have such a large absorption with the simultaneous possibility of tuning the frequency? As uh, apparently with the doping, you, uh, you modify both the resonance frequency and the level of absorption. Can you decouple these uh, two effects? So let me make sure I understood uh, the, the modulation of absorption and what's the second uh, the, the, Well, the frequency where you have the resonance which gives you 100% hundred per, uh, hundred percent absorption yes. is determined by the geometrical structures, by the uh, geometrical parameters and also the carrier de well, density. Is it possible to shift the frequency of the, oh, yes. of the, re of the resonance while keeping the 100% absorption? Okay, yeah, that, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so. The answer is slightly. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So the structures that I showed um, effectively constitute uh, low Q cavities. Uh, and in order to, and, and our goal, in fact, uh, was to achieve uh, as, as broadband absorption as we could. Uh, we thought this would be an interesting feature to be able to control electronically over the, a, a broad range of the infrared. So, in fact, the, uh, the, uh, width of the absorption here uh, is um, uh, is indicated here uh, over uh, uh, as you can see here over uh, oops no I guess I, the slides are now missing okay um, so, um, so so the answer is uh, we can we can move the absorption by uh, uh, about a line width or so. Um, if you wanted to uh, achieve greater than line width, the uh, tunability, that would also be possible, but you would want, in that case, to adopt a higher Q cavity than the ones that we showed. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Xiaodong from U Washington. So you show the thermal emission, I think one of the peak looks like at the uh, 1500 wave number. Is a coincidence of the phonon of the graphene, or just uh, maybe the summary emission couple of the phonon of the graphene? Uh, let's see, are you referring to the ultra fast thermal no, emission? No, just uh, the thermal emission oh, okay. of nano uh, Yeah, yeah, okay. So here we're, uh, let's see, I guess we're uh, 
we're not uh, there. The, the, could we bring the slides back? Would it be possible? No. Okay. Well, so the uh, so the answer is that the the peaks that we saw were indicative of uh, plasmon emission. So they were they were separated from the uh, phonon polarity. Oh, okay. Yeah. There we go. Um, so you can see here. Uh, this is, a, yeah, so there's a characteristic, the, the region where we expect to see coupling to phonons uh, is in this range and the plasmons are, are, are separated from this and that's, uh, we can also see here, for example, as we change the plasmon ribbon width, we see a characteristic tuning of the resonance, which is characteristic of a dipole plasmon resonance in the ribbon, so that's uh, sort of another piece of evidence that this uh, emission is emerging from the uh, plasma, uh, graphene plasmon uh, in the nano ribbons. Hi, uh, I'm Fu Ming Huang from Queen's University of Belfast. And you chose a perfect absorption. I'm just wondering whether it will be saturated at some intensity of light. So perfect absorption, and I'm sorry, what was the uh, question? Yeah, whether it will be saturated at some light intensity, 100% absorption will be saturated at some point. So, so you're wondering if the absorption has saturated? Is yeah. that the question? Yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so indeed, you know, the 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 absorption is uh, uh, is uh, is limited at 100. <laughs> percent I'm not uh, I'm not quite sure what is the, the whether your question goes uh, uh, more deeply than that, but. Yeah, I'm having a difficulty understanding the question. But. My question is, if the intensity of the light is increased, will the absorption still be 100 percentage, or it will be saturated up to a certain threshold? Density, you still have 100 oh, yes, okay. Uh, yes, uh, so at least within the range of experiments that we performed, uh, the absorption was not saturable. We didn't go to... Uh, uh, you know, pulsed laser excitation at very high powers, but uh, yeah. Okay, well, that's a uh, uh, extremely broad question. Uh, <laughs> let me, well, well, first of all, let me say that uh, 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 as an American, I, I first uh, 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 will uh, say that the uh, policies of the United States are not dictated only by the tweets that emanate from the White House, uh, but are, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, Congress has been very steadfast in bipartisan support of, of science. Uh, and in fact, all of the proposed cuts for the Department of Energy were ultimately restored in the current year budget. Uh, so I would say the outlook, at least for the investments in science in the United States, is, uh, is actually quite good at the moment. Um, I would say, by the way, that the interest that one of the factors that motivated our work on tunable perfect absorption uh, was uh, came uh, from a story actually when uh, Steve Chu was Secretary of Energy. He famously visited the Queen of England, uh, and the Queen asked what uh, she should do in terms of to motivate uh, sustainability in, among the citizens of the United Kingdom. And uh, Steve Chu recommended that she paint the Palace of Buckingham 
the roof of the palace of Buckingham, uh, Buckingham Palace white, uh, and the uh, queen declined, uh, understandably, since it's a historic monument. But we felt that, for example, being able to tune a radiative emission in the mid-infrared would, and uh, particularly in the thermal infrared in the 9 to 14 micron regime, might be able to give us some uh, very interesting opportunities to control radiation management and thermal energy management if this could actually be practically fabricated on large scales to actually control the radiative cooling of uh, objects in the infrared. So that was actually the, if you like, the broader motivation for some of the scientific work as well.